Bach uh, poet, um, Mario Lesesco. Um, my name is Peter Money. I'm from Harbor Mountain Press, uh, one of the sponsors of the Grace Paley Poetry Stage. Um, and we're very happy to be partners with the Burlington Book Festival. Grace Paley was also a friend of Harbor Mountain Press. Um, uh, we published her, her husband's work, uh, Bob Nichols. Um, I want to remember to give Mario an opportunity to answer questions. Uh, so, upon completion of this reading, um, feel free to, to raise, raise your hands and, and then we'll just be sure to get him to the, uh, the table outside the film house, uh, in the film house lobby to sign books. And I encourage you um, to consider his books. Uh, the closing time. Um, this is the first Harbor Mountain Press book, uh, but it's one of many of his books, um, and Framing Memories, the most recent. Uh, likely he will read from, from each today. Mario Sisko, the 2012 Walt Whitman Long Island Poet of the Year, appears on festival stages internationally. He has been honored by his native country, Croatia, most recently receiving an induction into the Croatian Academy of Sciences and Arts, and nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Mario Sisko has been called, with every reason, the most intelligent and passionate poet alive, maybe because he's been witness to the alternatives. In, 20, in 2003, he received the State University of New York Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Scholarship and Creative Activities. And more recently, he was honored with an Outstanding Faculty Award for his teaching at Nassau Community College. But friends, passion has several sides. His is a spinning seat that bridges the 20th and 21st centuries, not in kid gloves, but delivered more often dry, wry, fraught with a tendency towards stark or laughable subject matter. Welcome to the new existential realism, a bitter stew sweetened with lemons. Still, still he manages in a delightful voice, delightful, Mario may shake his chalk hands of the ghosts who are lurking at the impossible edges of the poems to see us delighting in their subjects. But hey, we're here. They're not sort of delighting. I have said his poems are the canary in difficulties mine, and that Mario Sisko is one of the most human voices available, a kind of one man against forgetting. Mario Sisko came to the United States in the 1970s to study. Returning to Croatia, he watched his friends and neighbors, classmates and neighborhood merchants, become with one another, victims of divide. In his poem, The Way, he writes, at the end I started to walk towards what looked like a tank, but turned out to be a house. I managed to open the door and walk in, not knowing whether I was crying or laughing. And then the light came to illuminate my way up the stairs. In 1993, Mario returned to the US, to Long Island, where he teaches. A Fulbright recipient and a prolific translator, he has helped to popularize many American authors, including William Styron, James Baldwin, Kurt Vonnegut, Saul Bellow, Walt Whitman, <coughs> and E.E. E. Cummins. As one man band makes a lot of noise. <laughs> and yet, when, if I've called him the Croatian Johnny Cash, I've said this because his wholesome prison was Bosnia, to his crack voice song, is how high the water mama is, unfortunately, country to country, foolish dictator in the guise of pearl tooth smiles, selection of the defeatist, always rising. Praise then the fists taking the pen like the last humor to any evil. This man has traveled a long way, an honest to goodness poet's poet. As his publisher, I could not say no to his poems. 
They were alive on gurneys. Some still made love in whispers. Some carved bloody murder with their tongues and shouts. Still others still sat in their corners laughing absurdly. His closing time and framing memories are published in the US by Harvey Mountain Press. Please welcome and give your attention to witness and survivor of the Sarajevo and war in Bosnia, of Sarajevo and war in Bosnia, a man who, in the best tradition, walks the line, Marin Sisko. I'm glad that this is recorded. So I can hold him responsible for having said, I cannot say no to his poems. Uh -huh. It's going to work in the future, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, uh, I have only one jacket, so I'll cover Clint Eastwood. That can be Paul Ryan and Romney. <laughs> well, thanks to uh, the uh, organizers and uh, <clears throat> I'm really honored, and especially thank you to uh, uh, Peach Amani, who is uh, my um, publisher. And uh, you know, whenever he sends me an email saying I'm going to this uh, reading or this festival, whatever, I always uh, email back, "Can I come? Can I come?" <laughs> so I'm glad he decided to tolerate me uh, one more time. I don't really uh, like to. Uh, uh, give you know a long introduction, or you know try to explain what uh, uh, any of my poems uh, may mean, or what is in the background of the poem. The first one ne needs a little bit, but whenever I try to do that, I remember you know, uh, and I have a, a, it here. Um, the parody <clears throat> disappeared in the New York Times by the Romanian poet, poet uh, Nina Cassian, who actually you know sort of a reflects uh, uh, upon this tendency of, uh, shall I say, American poets, uh, including myself sometimes, you know, to um, have a long introduction, uh, talk about poem, uh, behind the poem, the message of the poem. So at one point, uh, she is saying this. Uh, uh, a poet says, there was a, uh, a pear tree on my grandfather's farm, and one day I noticed then it, when its blossoms fell, they looked like a dandruff falling on my grandfather's shoulders. So I wrote a poem, and the poem goes like this. On my grandfather's farm, there used to be... Da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but the first poem uh, is, uh, uh, the protagonist uh, uh, is um, a child, uh, at least before, uh, who lives in a country that, okay, we can call a socialist country and whose mother is on um, the entirely different side of uh, whatever that country, you know, you'll see it from the poem. Anyway, but it's, it's, a, it's an appropriate poem to start with because it's entitled The Egg, okay, the primordial issue. Say three our fathers to have a soft boiled egg done right, my love say. And I said four, even five, slowly. When I thought I had sinned, looking at the photos of naked women father kept in his fishing bag, for I believed that would strengthen my faith. Mother's eggs always came out rawish, with the whites resembling mucus that would ooze out of the nose of a kid across the street whom I loved to cheat at the game of marbles. Anyway, mother's eggs I construed impartially were like that because she, in fact, prayed to Mary instead. One morning, while she was staring at the egg that bounced in the water and her lips were moving silently, I ventured my long prepared remark. The teacher said God would never be able to tell us whether he created a chicken or an egg first. Do you know? She slapped me and said, don't you ever ask me those stupid dialectical Marxist questions again. This school poisons your head. God help us all. But. I wanted to know what negated what, so I decided to be a Marxist. I refused to eat eggs, chicken, or any kind of meat because that meant oppressing other living creatures. When recuperating from paratyphus, I kept my mouth tightly shut, making my mother cry as she held the plate with chicken soup in her lap. 
In school, I surpassed even my teacher, declaiming about the exploitation of the masses, the corruption of the rich, who could afford caviar and frogs' legs and the proletariat only cabbage and beans. One day, the teacher called me to his desk. Where is all this fervor coming from, he whispered. It's the egg and the chicken, comrade teacher. He pointed stiffly to the corner, and I stood there sweating and inhaling the damp, flaky paint. After the class, when everyone else was gone, he said gently, come here. Enough of that dialectical crap of yours, you hear me? What you get in school is for the world. What you believe in is for you. Listen well. God, in his infinite wisdom, created the egg and the chicken simultaneously. How's that for an explanation? And he motioned with his crooked finger to the door. Instantly, my whole world crumbled down. I ran home and asked that night for scrambled eggs. Mother crossed herself, mumbling sorrowfully, Lord, please help me with this boy. The following morning, I opened the cupboard and took out two eggs. I let them boil till the water evaporated, and I went horse praying. Oh, there's another poem about eggs and chicken. I don't know. Well, anyway. Of roosters, sex, and semblances. One late foggy afternoon, he says, as I stand at his bed holding a spoon and a plate with a beguiling cure all chicken soup pieces of meat with bones, the stomach, the heart, the liver there, everything I've thrown in, hoping that would help him regain his strength. Mother came home carrying a rooster under her coat, a skinny bird with mean eyes, though a glorious black and red plumage. No one in the neighborhood had one in those days after the war, nor did we have money to afford such a creature. She kept him in the kitchen, a prisoner of war almost. And I concluded she had stolen him during one of her excursions, as she called them, into the scattered hamlets across the river in search of some real food. The rooster grew stronger and bigger, so she clipped his wings to prevent him from jumping onto the stool chest, uh, coal chest and chairs. Though his ludicrous hopping around made me angry, as did my mother's remark each time he spread his useless wings, extended his neck and crowed. The sun is not rising. But I know what it is. I ate that rooster feathers and all many times in my dreams, though mother kept saying, never a good soup does a rooster make, but some eggs by you would be a help. Mm. I dared not ask her what, she would, what that would change, until one day a rich neighbor's daughter, a red-haired nymph I dreamed of conquering after I dealt with a dragon in the thicket, smuggled her father's book and showed me a drawing of a man in pointed slippers atop a woman with a red mark on her forehead and dark hair that cascaded down her naked breasts. That's what roosters do to hens to make eggs, she declared. She took me down into the basement, he whispers haltingly, staring at the ceiling as if retrieving the memory from the shapes the frames of three candles play with, sprawled on two plates on two sacks in her cubicle, pulling me down like a rag doll on top of her. I felt dull pain in my knees and prickling in my groin, as if an army of ants had suddenly invaded my shorts. Her lavender hair made me dizzy, and I was relieved when a moment later she laughed witch-like and pushed me off her. See, she said, nothing to it. Her eyes aglow like the roosters in our kitchen. That night, while shivering in my bed, my eyes shut tight as I was trying to banish the drawing and the girl's rose-pimpled legs from my mind. I kept repeating to myself, Oh God, merciful God, please don't have her lay an egg tomorrow. <laughs> okay, enough of joking. <laughs> Checkpoint. At a checkpoint made of tree trunks and barrels filled with sand, a group of pale bus riders standing in a meandering line depends on one man whose belly will soon have his blouse buttons burst. Am I a Jew? A Muslim? A Catholic? Which one does he want to hate more today? Will my name on the soiled piece of paper confuse him or make him pull me out by my shirt sleeve as if I were a disposable part of the human race? 
deemed perhaps to be worthy of living or dying, as my uncle used to say, by the look of my penis? Am I saved or doomed if he suddenly remembers, or I do, that we went to the same high school? As I try to keep my sternal mastoids from teaching my mind from being forced to accept that someone who has no power over life is a bigger coward than someone who does, he positions himself before me, his sourish breath becoming my breath. Do you know if Maria is still there? His words burn on my face like amber, there, meaning in the city. And I feel a cold sweat run down my spine. Am I done for if I say yes? Or if I say no? Pretend I did or did not recognize him? But he just grins and hands me back my papers, moving to a young woman next to me and motioning with his hand for her to step out, still glancing at me, while I rock back and forth, staring past him, past my life at the jagged line of skeleton trees on the mountain ridge where the dying daylight still lingers. It's an ugly poem. I, 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 I read uh, at one point uh, um, out on Long Island, and uh, a lady after the reading comes to me and, and says, your poems are so depressive. <laughs> mm, yeah, what do you want me to do? <laughs> uh, this poem is entitled Conversion. I have to tell you a little story behind it. I sent this poem to uh, a journal in, in England, <clears throat> and that was the first time that journal published this poem. And um, I got an email from the editor uh, uh, informing me that uh, he nominated the, the, uh, the, the poet uh, uh, for the Forward Poetry Prize. It's a fancy little thing in the best single poem category in England. And I was all happy jumping. And then, you know, I looked at the Guardian and, uh, you know, just checking, vanity kicks in. And after about, about a month uh, uh, and a half, you know, uh, that was my name. Uh, nominated, blah, 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 blah. And I emailed him back and I thanked him, blah, blah, blah. And he says, no bother, I love your poem, Conversation. And I said to myself, Conversation? What, what does he mean by conversation? The title of the poem is Conversion. <laughs> and it has a meaning, you know. <clears throat> so I'm debating with myself. Shall I send him an email? And simply say, how dare you change the title of my poem? without either asking me or doing whatever so that I know. And I was just about to send the, that email when I get an email from him. Great news, your poem was shortlisted for the forward prize. And I said, I better not do anything. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care whether the title, the title is conversation or conversion. It's shortlisted. I don't care. No. But the title of the poem is conversion. <laughs> Wait, wait, so did you win? No. Oh. <laughs> what did you expect? Yeah. An American from another country winning a prize in England? Yeah, come on. But it was uh, the finalist, so that's good enough. It was good enough for me. I came upon a man in black who sat on a tank tending his sheep that grazed impassively around the craters and among dead bodies. I'm looking for my son, I said squinting. The bullets in his cartridge belt slung over his shoulders shone in the sun like teeth. He smiled, chewing a cigarette to the other corner of his mouth and motioned with his hands to the field. Plenty to choose from, he said. The sheep were moving away toward the shade of a big oak tree, the bodies following on all fours. I strained my eyes and my ears to hear the bell I knew. He slid down and stared at me. Is that your stomach growling, he asked. I'm just trying to find my son, I whispered. You want me to shoot one? He spat out the butt and stomped it with his foot, boot that was like my son's. We are talking about some good meat, he grinned. The shirt looked familiar, but I couldn't tell. My sheep started to fan out, and I suddenly heard a dog yelp behind me. He whistled the sound, thin and piercing, making the bodies stop. I felt the sweat run down my buttocks and legs, as if someone had, was punching holes in my ribs. 
have you seen my son? I uttered, not knowing whether any sound left my mouth. You never had a son, he yelled and cocked his submachine gun. The boots were the same, and so was the shirt. And the Mickey Mouse watch on his wrist was the same. Tell you what, he said and laughed, I'll be your son. And this is a little crazy poem. What time is it? Ah, okay. The Conduct of War. <coughs> From an old dank cardboard box in the cellar, I dumped out a whole forgotten battalion of tin soldiers I used to play with as a kid. How it got there and when, I couldn't remember. Perhaps I outgrew wars or mother believed people when they proclaimed this war ended all wars. It would have seemed so as I gazed silently at my troops, once colorful uniforms, now just faded patches, telling me they fought in all decisive battles. Their drawn swords twisted or broken, many a base they stood on gone, making them look as good as dead. Some without a hand or a leg I put carefully back into the box, together with two wooden horses, their head dangling on a shiny wire. What I really needed now was a few tanks. If nothing else, some heavy artillery pieces, for I knew the advanced armored units that had already reached the suburb, intent on crossing the river behind my building and linking up with the encamped mercenaries. My army was the only thing that stood in their way, yet no plan would I have been able to devise that would save us from being overrun. The following night, when the steady rumble of tracks and engines began to drown out the croaking of frogs at the riverbank, I painted with a crayon I found on the floor a Red Cross sign on the box and put it in the drum of a discarded washing machine. I took those battle-ready soldiers to the lobby and set them down on the highest step, all of us in a combat line facing the front door. Later, through half-closed eyes in the dark, I saw suddenly a ten-year-old kid I grew up with burst in, brandishing a wooden sword, a paper cocked hat on his head, and we fought again. I, a twelve-year-old veteran, swinging my mother's broomstick until we both fell exhausted and said, Truce? Oh, I'm going to read this poem because I always uh, screw up reading it. Because it has everything in it, uh, including the kitchen sink. <laughs> it's a take on, on the so-called uh, uh, the War of Jenkins' Ear. There was such a war, believe me. Uh, Robert Jenkins claimed that the Spanish uh, Armada, you know, uh, boarded his uh, uh, brig and took everything and in the process chopped off his ear, which <coughs> he then sent to the British Parliament. Mm -hmm. Of course, the king was um, the king we remember, George the Third, not our George, another George, okay. And uh, the year became, uh, you know, uh, the major cause of the war between England and Spain, which led then to the uh, secession uh, 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 of Austria. And the conflict was uh, popularly called the War of Jenkins' Ear. And the British, by the way, put down the Spanish at, uh, in, at West, in West Indies at a town called Portobello. I use the town Portobello. I see I'm complicating. I'm using the town Portobello because of the word bello, because the original word for the war was uh, bellum, but nobody liked it because it was too close to the word bello, which means beautiful. So we actually you know, accepted the Germanic word vera, uh, which meant you know, campaign, or our word uh, war. There's one more thing that is there. Uh, it's a crazy poem, okay? Um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, um, the, the slang phrase, uh, uh, to see the elephants from the Vietnam War, it actually comes uh, after the, um, you know, um, <coughs> war, the, the um, Mexican War, um, when we started to uh, uh, say, I heard uh, the owl and saw the elephant, 
It actually means the barrage artillery fire. Okay, so here's the poem. <clears throat> Trying to mix things. It's entitled the year. You see how good I am? I have the egg, I have chickens, mm -hmm. I have the ear. <clears throat> You'll get the reference uh, of Virgo Aurus. B believe that um, you know God did this through her ear rather than whatever else it was, immaculate. <laughs> Virgo Aurus, oh, there are multiple voices. The voice of George, his counselor, and Jenkins. Virgo Aurus, I send to you, my lord, in this handmade Kenneth Cole case. My faith I place in your just dictum, our faith in the deeds of the ethnoparlaire. To lob off one pina, my fellow citizens, and leave the membrane unprotected tells us that we are all affected. Thus I ask, in this hour, do we not all feel ravaged? Vera or Campania? Will they come along if I promise them not a soul will be lost? I can always claim we shall spiel in a krieg with my brand new set of terracotta figurines. People will understand. An ear is an ear. It is in our national interest to be all ears to pin their ears back. Our three deckers are invisible to their radars in crow's nests. Good tidings I bring, my lord. The bellum wasn't bellow, and portal is in ruin. But I venture to say that we were compassionate, and the humanitarian aid is on the way. We shall also, with your gracious approval, send them other things to show we mean well. Teddy bears, crayons, balls, generously gifted by Toys R Us, also surplus army tents. Others have to pitch in. My advisors tell me our requests have fallen on deaf ears, pardon the phrase. Oh, no one will remember the ear, only if we contained the endemic conflicts and kept our ear to the ground. Shine times are before us, successions, secessions. People talk of glad bags, seeing the elephants, I want to leave all this, go to play some golf. Okay, one more, of belonging. A man in the middle of the road, his white hair drenched by rain, the pants splashed by swerving cars, waves his arms in slow motion, as if trying to downshift or even arrest all motion. I pull onto the shoulder and get out, focusing on something at his feet. My mind cluttered with images that should have been removed long ago. A contorted body hit by a sniper, a dog shot for fun. There's no house around and I do not see his car, yet I run across ducking my head instinctively and make out a dog and one eye open as though waiting for the command to stop playing dead. Do you need help? My words are drowned by a siren, my presence dwarfed by two descending silhouettes. Get back in your car, one yells, I do not move. Get off the road now, the other bellows, the man doesn't move. I'm grabbed and I resist. The man is grabbed and he resists. The cold black leather of the patrol car's back seat smells the same as the one I was on. One eye gazing at a void like that dog's, my palm pressing against the ribs to block the bleeding from a shrapnel wound. Was I dragged from the pavement? Or did I drag someone from the pavement? Whose drops of blood splattered on the cement like a lazy summer shower? The raindrops and the headlights become white fluttering moths and the man from the open road sitting next to me turns his head and smiles. Is that your dog, I hear myself ask? Isn't that now your dog too, I hear him say?